Our next speaker is Jill Schaefer, who um, is following up with uh, information on Eagle regulations in, in, in the USA. All right, last talk, ready to go here. <laughs> As I'm sure all of you in this room know, the Golden Eagle has a whole Arctic distribution. So therefore, any research conducted in the United States that aims to lessen the impact of anthropogenic disturbance on Golden Eagles or any policies that are enacted to ameliorate that impact from anthropogenic disturbance may have implications or may be relevant to countries in the Palearctic. I am going to present two federal United States laws that aim to protect the golden eagle, to keep the population stable, and present two federal guidelines specific to wind energy development. And I will wrap the talk up with discussing the U.S. federal mitigation policy that uh, underpins both the federal laws and the federal guidelines specific to wind energy development. In the coterminous United States, and coterminous Western United States is uh, Western United States excluding Alaska, the uh, work of Brian Millsap and his colleagues has shown that there are about 13,800 individual golden eagles in this area. They are uh, protected in the United States by state and federal laws. And at this time, the species is not considered to be threatened or endangered. Uh, Brian Millsap and his colleagues further estimated the mortality risks, the top four sources of mortality to golden eagles in the coterminous Western United States. They state or believe that 74% of all deaths that occur in the first year of a, an eagle's life are can be attributed to either shooting, electrocution, collisions, or poisoning. And I, I believe that's, you'll find that familiar for eagles in the Palearctic region as well. Collisions refers could refer to deaths due to hitting vehicles, wind turbine blades, or um, electrical power lines. So the two federal laws that protect the golden eagle in the United States are the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, often referred to as the MBTA. The second federal law is the Bald and Golden Eagle Protection Act, which is often shortened to BGEPA. I realize that might not translate well. The Migratory Bird Treaty Act is not specific to bald and golden eagles. It applies to all migratory birds uh, in North America. It, the value of this law is that it defines take, all right? Um, and that definition is important to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, which is the federal agency within the Department of the Interior that is responsible for issuing permits for take. So what is take? Take is, the definition says it is illegal to pursue, hunt, shoot, wound, kill, trap, capture or collect, or attempt to do any of the above activities. The Migratory Bird Treaty Act also states that it is illegal to possess, sell, purchase, barter, import, export, or transport any migratory bird, part, nest, or egg without a permit. The Migratory Bird Treaty Act also establishes criminal penalties for violations. The Bald and Golden Eagle Protection Act is the second federal law that aims to protect the, the eagles. This law also has a definition of take, and uh, again, the, it, the agency responsible for issuing permits is the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. The definition of take under the Bald and Golden Eagle Protection Act is defined as to pursue, shoot, 
shoot at, poison, wound, kill, capture, trap, collect, molest, or disturb individual eagles, their parts, nests, or eggs. This act also establishes a preservation standard. This is basically a management objective that is aimed to keep breeding populations at stable or increasing levels. The take limit for golden eagles is currently zero. So any take authorized by permit must be offset by compensatory mitigation. I'll talk about this in more detail in the next slide. This act also establishes criminal penalties for violations. So the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to take is, is risk averse. Take must be below an estimated limit that allows for a sustainable population of the golden eagle. Any additional take must be mitigated. So for golden eagles, based on the where we believe the population level exists today, a permit must be offset at a one to 1.2 offset ratio. What this means is that the loss of one eagle must be offset by either saving 1.2 eagles from mortality or adding 1.2 eagles to the population. So you might be asking why the uh, take level is zero and why the ratio is one to 1.2 and you know, not one to 1.1. Uh, well, Millsap and his colleagues estimated what the allowable take limit would be that would keep the golden eagle population at a stable level. And then they also estimated a legal take. So a legal take is landowners or people out there illegally shooting eagles. And of course, we can't know what that exact number is, right? It's illegal. You shoot, shovel, and shut up. But the best estimate says that that illegal take is high and actually exceeds the level, thank you for laughing, exceeds the level um, that, that allows the golden eagle population to stay stable. So because that take, that illegal take is so high, the take level is zero and the mitigation ratio is one to 1.2. There are two federal, uh, there's two sources of guidelines for wind energy developers. So these two federal documents now are specific to wind energy development. The first is the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's land-based wind energy guidelines. And the second is the Eagle Conservation Plan. Note that unlike the federal laws, both of these documents are completely voluntary. So the compliance by wind developers is voluntary. There are no federal regulation teeth, so to speak, um, that makes them comply. So that is an important difference between these two guidance documents and the two laws that I addressed earlier. So Todd set this up very well, this, this, uh, these wind energy guidelines in terms of discussing the levels of uh, surveys by which wind developers assess impact and risk. The wind energy guidelines are not specific to golden eagles, okay? They apply to other biota of which we are concerned, other bird species, bats, what have you. So it, it's a broad overview of, of concerns that scientists have over the impact of wind energy development. The value of this document is that it, it provides a framework to assess that uh, those impacts and evaluate those risks. 
uh, because Todd explained these tiers very well in the previous slide, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that framework, just to point out that tiers one to three address pre-construction, you know, what, what can possibly be avoided or minimized to avoid or minimize risk, whereas tiers three to five uh, are post-construction. You know, after the turbines are up, what's the impact? What can we learn to benefit future development of wind farms? The Eagle Conservation Plan, as the name implies, is specific to eagles. It's considered a supplement to the land-based wind energy guidelines. It provides measures for the siting, construction, and operation of wind facilities that are consistent with the Migratory Bird Treaty Act and that are consistent with the Bald and Golden Eagle Protection Act. Basically, this helps developers understand how to stay within federal compliance, what they need to do to uh, assess risk, minimize that risk, and it also sets them up to gather the necessary biological data that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service will ask of them in order to give them a permit for a take. The final guidance document I want to address is the Fish and Wildlife Services Mitigation Policy. This is actually, you know, a, a federal policy. Todd already described the three-tiered approach. Try to first avoid an impact. If you can't avoid, then minimize the impact. If you can't minimize the impact, then mitigate. So in terms of, go of golden eagles specifically, when we talk about avoidance, we're talking about calculating a level of risk, predicting using this model of New and his colleagues, what the level of risk of a, a wind footprint will be. That model assigns that proposed wind facility uh, category designation. And if it's a category one, the Fish and Wildlife Service will suggest either not building the facility there or moving certain turbines or reducing the number of turbines to be built. In terms of the minimization part of the three-tiered mitigation strategy, there are a number of viable options to minimize an impact to golden eagles. Um, they include removing carrion or perches or other uh, things, you know, other like prey that that um, the golden eagles will be attracted to an area for. They could include installing flight diverters. We've heard a lot about that today. It could include inhibiting nest building. Um, as Todd mentioned, it, it could include curtailment, which is the temporary turning off of high-risk turbines. And there are several other systems. And I, I know that Todd mentioned these, so I'm not going to um, belabor this point. M these minimization options, if you're interested, are actually detailed in um, this paper here, Allison and others, 2017. So the final tier of the mitigation strategy is, is mitigate. And currently there is only one program that is authorized by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to compensate for take. And that is called the Bald Eagle and Golden Eagle Electrocution Prevention in Lieu Fee Program. It's basically a mitigation bank. And I, I say if you have questions about this, uh, James Dwyer and Richard Harness that are here today would be excellent sources for more information on this program because they work on the uh, re retrofitting of the high-risk poles for a living. So you have an excellent resource right here today to ask detailed questions about this in lieu fee program. There are other mitigation options that 
are probably very viable. It's just that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service doesn't quite have the scientific uh, numbers or uh, quality of data at this point to make them official, uh, an official program. But there are there's considerable research in this area and a push to make some of these uh, more uh, to make these standardized. They include removing animal carcasses from roads to reduce animal vehicle collisions. There's pushes to address the lead toxicosis issue with lead ammunition and re uh, rehabilitating injured eagles and boosting populations of eagles prey. So different subsets of researchers are examining each of these subtopics. And again, uh, Allison et al. 2017 details these options in more detail. One mitigation option that has high promise and may in the near future be accepted by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service as an authorized uh, mitigation strategy is this idea of removing animal carcasses near roads. Work by Lonsdorf and others has shown if you can remove a carcass at least 12 meters from a road, it can save up to seven eagles a year, depending on location. So. Uh, I would say this would be one mitigation option to be looking out for its advancement with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And with that, I will say that any of the resources that I cited in this talk are available in a in PDF format from me. So thank you, and I will address any questions you might have. Thanks, Jill. We do have a minute or two for questions if people are interested in uh, U.S. Mm -hmm. law. You mentioned the boost uh, of um, prey populations as a mitigation measurement of the eagles. Um, have you ever, or is there an example, or have you ever tried that um, stop the hunting of the uh, the, the prey animals uh, in an area so that you pay the hunters, for example, they stop hunting these, these species that the, the race of the, the prey happen? I don't believe there's efforts to reduce the hunting of the prey populations. I, I think that would be very unpopular with, with the landowners that for the most part, own the West. <laughs> um, as you know, the United States has a lot of uh, private land and a lot of hunters. So I think the idea there is that you boost populations of, of you know, rabbits and small rodents and prey dogs and those sorts of things by conservation efforts to address those wildlife species, not um taking away the opportunity of hunters to recreate in the outdoors todd would you disagree with that assessment i i agree you can't take guns away from americans right um, and their opportunities but, uh, to use them legally <laughs> i don't think it no, would be that effective. no the, the the primary prey populations for golden eagles in the west are things like prairie dogs, which are sciuridae, and jackrabbits, which are lagomorphs. And the reasons both of them are declining substantially and of cons conservation concern, but it's primarily because of habitat loss and, in the case of prairie dogs, just outright persecution and, and uh, poisoning and things like that. Um, there are There may be some issues with prairie dogs, with hunt, with shooting, but by and large, habitat loss is just a much, much bigger issue. Um, you may be able to compensate for some habitat loss by reducing uh, shooting, but that's, you know, a Band-Aid approach. You're not solving the problem. I, yeah. I was, I was going to compliment your answer on that, because we do have examples of the success of this method in Spain with Imperial Eagle. Right. Imperial eagle is endangered uh, species, endangered of extinction. The main prey is the rabbit, 
but it, it also consumes uh, pigeons and, and partridges. And at the, at the beginning, the administration was focused on improving populations of rabbits, but this gave a lot of problems for agricultural areas, right, for farmers. And then they changed, thinking that the problem was going to be exactly that, like not very popular for hunters, because Spain is as well full of hunters, right? <laughs> and, and it worked. Right, and now the the compensation measures is is is, is shifting to the um, compensation payment for uh, hunting uh, clubs, right, and and hunting farms. So they rise up the rabbit populations, right. And the follow up question: These mitigation um, measurements, like this, uh, raising the prey population. Has it to be in in the same location as the wind farm, or how it is with the distances? So, is it possible to make it twenty kilometers away, or how how it's? It Are you referring to the in lieu fee program, the only authorized? Uh, that 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 basically, the retrofitting is done at the high risk poles. They could be anywhere that ha that is no one to kill the most eagles. It might not be, you know, anywhere near the wind farm. Okay, so there's no necessary uh, connection to the, no. the particular wind farm? Okay. No, Thank you. not for that program. Sorry about that, if I can compliment this as well. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> we have an example, several examples in, in Spain. Uh, to do that, we have to first tag the eagle the golden eagle is specifically. So we capture them, uh, we tag them. So we analyze specifically the territory and, 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 and we saw how the eagle overlaps with the wind farm, right? And then we also assessed the most frequent areas of uh, hunting for the eagle. And then we boosted the, the prey populations in those areas that are not in the wind farm, but are still in the territory. Right. There was a question from the back, I think, also. Uh, if I may, does it work? I have a question that is not related to your topic now, but more to siting and, and planning. I wonder if you guys know of of uh, plans for like combined combined energy structures, like we uh, places that. Uh, uh, wind farms are combined with uh, photovoltaic uh, plants underground or something because there is a logic in doing this and may turn the area less hospitable for prey species, for example. And if anyhow we we are building the, the two types of energy structures, maybe we put them together in one place. So you're asking if there's a push to co-locate solar and wind energy facilities? Uh, in the United States, most of the solar facilities at this point are going in the southwest, um, whereas I think a lot of the wind energy development is still in the central Great Plains. But there might be some. Todd, do you know differently? I mean, that's my. No, impression. that's <clears throat> so far. I don't know of any sort of co-location. Often because something that's good for one. Wind, wind turbines are often built on hills and solar facilities are built in flat areas. And I think they don't always, sometimes they probably do work together, but other times they don't. Did we have another question? Скажите, пожалуйста, существуют ли в США законодательные или нормативные ограничения скорости вращения турбин ветряных станций? I can't hear that question. This is the uh, the speed at which um, I think the limitations are engineering, uh, not not legal. And so, um, the if the turb when these turbine blades are one hundred meters, if they go too fast, they will break the motor. And so it, it's an engineering problem, not a legal one. So we have no laws on it. I didn't hear the question. Are, are there laws about um, 
the speed at which blades can spin. Oh, I don't think so. Yeah. Uh, I have a question uh, related to the previous presentation. Uh, can we have the guidelines online? Can we download these documents? Because they're, uh, in some countries... They're in the PDF I can send out. I can actually attach them to the WhatsApp. These are very useful documents because in some countries, the wind turbines and wind energy, they are in initial stages. So these documents are very important to have. So I wanted to ask that if they're available online, we can download it. They are available. I mean, you, you could Google the title and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and, and, and you could get them yourself, but they are in a PDF of all the resources that were cited. And although Todd, this talk, right? Or the talk before, the t I don't know that you made up a list of- Yeah, I, if, if you want, you're welcome to email either of us and we can send some things. And the, the Blaith put the, uh, the, the best practices guide, it's already in the WhatsApp group. So we, yeah. we should share these and you know ask questions in the WhatsApp group if, if you can't find something. But that being said, since that venue is so impersonal, feel free to email us too so we know who you are, where you work, and what your area of expertise is. It might make let's, some connections. Let's have one more question and then start to break Could up. This, and I, yeah. I think okay. Well, well, we... Yeah. Okay. Uh, what, what happens in terms of legislation and mitigation? If the eagle mortality is high, but the population remains stable, you have influx of birds from elsewhere. In that case, the companies have to do something. Is there a limit? Is there a well? A this is what they're attempting to do. Is I, I mean, they're you know, if the, the the illegal aspect is so high and that's so disparate, it's so spread out. It could be occurring in any state, at any time, at anywhere. So. Trying to curtail the illegal aspect of it is is very very difficult, right? So, kind of the burden then actually becomes on the wind developers to compensate for all of this illegal activity that they're not responsible for. But that's why they're based on a mathematical formula that rate is one to one point two, and I think that that's the best that the Fish and Wildlife Service can can do and defend scientifically at, at this point to uh, have it accepted, you know, legislatively and, and by the public. There is an interesting comparison with bald eagle populations. So we have golden eagle and bald eagle and golden eagle populations are stable or declining. We're not sure. Bald eagle populations are growing exponentially. And so the effort by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is focused on golden eagles. There are laws that protect bald eagles and they are enforced, but the, the regulations around take or the, the guidance around take and compensation is much more relaxed and it's much less stringent for that reason. 